time to set KC presenter. And I am presenting them with a shot of just bourbon because they have no nasty alcohol. But thank you so much for coming out. Also, I'm going to be presenting on physical pet testing. This is the Technics of the Trash Panda. Thank you very much. And if you don't shut the fuck up for this presentation, I will have the next oh, 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 oh. What he said. Thank you very much. Here we go. Oh, sorry, you gotta do the shot. I'll do the shot so you can have the sound of my voice driving to this. Alcohol is alcohol. Thank you so much for the hospitality. You've been a great crowd so far. So. Woo! Woo! Oh, yeah! I forgot your name. What's your name? Oh, my name is Angel. Uh, quick intro, Angel. Uh, my handle is around being quiet. Yeah, my, my handle online is Colin Stone. You can find me in the Set KC Discord. Thank you. So, for the presentation, I have included some slides available as a PDF. The slides do not have video demonstration content because I don't fucking know how to put videos into PDFs. So, I'm going to show you the RFC for it. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll gladly do that. But for now, I do have those slides with those videos redacted. We'll still go through them. You can get Quist right there and have a copy on your phone and follow along. Thank you. Quishing, Quishing, AI, AI, Big Data, thank you very much. Um, I will leave this up for probably about the next 10 seconds, and we will go to go. Did anybody count? Uh, that, that shot is hitting a little too early. <laughs> Perfect! Thank you. I see you. Awesome. Welcome to Tactics of the Trash Panda. TTP is another fucking acronym uh, that you can memorize. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I haven't gotten through the presentation yet, but uh, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, disclaimer here, the following presentation will deal with security and adjacent topics to security. Consequentially, some content may be of adult nature. This content is handled in a professional manner by the presenter, me, and I hope you can handle it with respect as an audience. Y'all have been pretty respectful so far, so just keep doing that. You're great. Additionally, content is provided for educational use only. I take no responsibility for any actions taken by the audience as a result of this. Let's behave ourselves and have some fun. Get out of here, that's the fan. So let's talk about some of the problems that come up with physical pen testing. Uh, with an increase of tradecraft, you have an increase in cost to develop and research that tradecraft. Uh, and the materials go into that as well. There are some notable names in the industry that provide this material, such as your Hack 5, your, your Sparrows, uh, type of gear, etc. And sometimes it's even if you want it and you get it approved, etc., and it fits the scenario that you're working, you don't get it because, oh, manufacturer or something of that nature. So we have this concept of more tradecraft, more problems. So there's also other restrictions that create additional problems. So you can see the lockpicking laws here. You can talk to the tool people in the back. They would know a lot more about that than I do. Um, you know, there's also uh, this, this thing that is going on. You flipper owners, you, they're coming for you. Uh, they're coming to take the flipper. <laughs> Certain <laughs> countries. <laughs> and the Teslas, the SDRs are taking our AI. Uh, and also, uh, an additional problem of having your suspicion increase around you before you reach your objectives of entering a target. So the abstract for this presentation is essentially, there are expensive tools and they're cool, but they're often not needed for practical exploitation of issues. Having a name brand or single purpose device can reduce your pretext and your flexibility as to saying who you are and why you are doing X. It's funny to have a huge return on investment as well when your tools are made of everyday items. I have had a client recently tell me, oh, but you're sophisticated attackers and you're able to do this. I went back and did part of the test with a fucking plastic bottle. Okay, so anyways, sometimes you want to feel like Batman, but in reality, you should just be a fucking raccoon. Uh, you can go through the trash, you can scavenge things, and create your own tools out of everyday items and garbage. So here's our agenda. I'm just going to be talking about who I am, how you present yourself, who has some advice for packing, my own kids, some extra trade crap, and tooling primer, and attempting to replicate those with our own variants, and we have video demos along the way. So who am I? Just quickly, um, I am an infosec doer. I never feel comfortable calling myself a professional. I've been being paid to do this for the past six years, so maybe it's at that, that point we should do it. But who knows? I'm a senior hacker at a place. I am a 3D printer enthusiast. 
I am trained in multiple dis disciplines ranging from net and AppSec, physical, home, to research. Um, I'm a proud member of DC316 and occasionally dropping by AHA and uh, a bunch of other security groups like SACASI that I've now been introduced to. So thank you all for the hospitality. Fucking yell. Oh my god! Let's talk about physical evaluations. So, they're a great way to show that the internal network isn't too hard to reach. A lot of times we put protections in place on our email, on our external networks, and it could be kind of a, a blind spot we induce on ourselves because we forget about the physical aspect of where these servers fucking sit. Uh, there's lots of prep work before even scoping the place out in person, and there's all of the legality of paperwork. If you do this on your own, there are some documents online. I believe Dave Kennedy from Trusted Sec has published his uh, papers that he puts out for his team um, after the company that not, shall not be named incident. Uh, I don't know if anybody got that, but whatever. Um, and there's always going to be a time when you have to generate pretext out of thin air. You're not always going to have repeat scenarios where you're saying pretext works. I'm sorry, that's just how it goes. Shut the fuck up! Thank what you. the fuck? <laughs> Who the fuck's pissing angel? <laughs> what does preparation for a gig entail? So, a shitload of paperwork, dude. So, ignoring the paperwork, logistics and contracts and all that aside. Uh, preparation. So, essentially, I have this meme over here. I'm not going to read it out loud, but you can understand that. There's probably a story behind that one. I'm not going to say it. You can't read that? Oh, okay, sorry, yeah, yeah, okay, so essentially you have sophisticated operation yielding critical issues, and in the back fight here you have 36 hours of reading, getting groped by the TSA, pulling entry to material from the dumpster outside of the pizza place in O'Reilly's. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Plastic bomb! Ah. So, knowing your objectives, connections, out of office, trash schedules, this is just going over some pointers of data you would collect. This is no, by no means a comprehensive list. So definitely expand this on your own, do your own thing. There are different types of data to collect for different types of companies and industries. Uh, surveillance schedules, antics, behavior, your company culture, etc. Having continuously planning, luck, and a lot more reading than you anticipate. <laughs> So what do you read? Fire code! Yeah, this is great! It's like RFC, but for, for doors and buildings. It's kind of cool. Um, some people follow it, some people don't. Uh, so it's just be prepared. So if you don't want to read the actual document, there is a great presentation online over an older revision of this standard uh, that has examples for some of the important commercial uh, building doors uh, you can check. There's also ADA compliance, which online you can find it. It's free. Uh, you can take it home, uh, the government knows that I have 3,000 of these uh, already, but this is basically RFC through doors and buildings again, but just added compliance measures, and part of the whole under the door double spiel and shtick is this thing right here, 34 to 48 inches, no comment. So let's talk about packing for pretext. Uh, improv class goes a long way. You don't always need some super like highly skilled red team operator course that you pay a, a crap load of money for, right? Uh, sometimes just having the social aspect gets you into things. I have a story once of how I know I am going to hell because I social engineered a Midwestern woman. <laughs> We showed up to the client site, right? We're, we're, it's operating hours, so we're going to the back. We know the IT closet's in the back. That's where they told us. It's kind of like a covert for that location, but like all the other people are in on it, right? Uh, they gave us hats with the company name on there, so we walked in there. I had my like full tack bag. I didn't even try to hide anything, dude. And we went in there, me and my buddy, and we go in and we say, hey, we're here with X company. We're here to look at the IT closet. And they said, oh, it's locked, okay, I can show you, it's right over here. And I said, oh, okay, we, we probably have a key somewhere around here. And I just like pointed at my bag, and it's, it's all jingle jangle, right? Um, we go to the back and, and I start looking at the door and I'm like, oh, they're right behind me. Um, and she cuts me off and she says, oh, do you need a key? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that would be, that would be great. I'm going to hell, man. <laughs> uh, I would love a key. So she says, okay, yeah, let me get it for you. We have a spare over here. I gotta take a phone call, I'll be right back. So as she's doing that, I have the opportunity to go ahead and try to shim this door. And I have this tool in my sleeve, and I'll show you pictures of, of the tool here later. And I pull it out and I shut the door, I'm fumbling fucking around, and I get it shimmed. And I open it, door's open, cool, we can wire into a backbone network to take over an electrical grid. That's awesome. She comes back and she says, Oh, did y'all get it open? And I said, Yeah, you know, Brian from the office, uh, uh, he, I forgot he gave me this key and it was buried in my bag. I'm so sorry. And yeah, we went about a day and we were hooked into backbone wireless infrastructure, or, uh, electrical infrastructure somewhere in the nation. <laughs> 
Um, so talking about pretext, so essentially you have some basic classes of pretext. These are the ones I commonly use. Uh, there are blends, there are mixes. These don't define guidelines, right? Uh, you have the authoritative ones, which are normally like your help desk or your IT person or some C-level that hates people, I don't know. Uh, you have your mutual bonding pretext. You can light somebody's cigarette. You can say, oh, hey, yeah, I got that door open for you because I, I shipped it earlier. Here you go. Uh, you can be the inquisitor. You can be an interviewee. You can be a job candidate. You can pull up on site and say, I'm here to shake somebody's hand and get a job today. <laughs> or you can be an ignorant end user. I, I legitimately did like a very old head uh, voice impression this one time over the phone, and I was just like, I don't know, what am I supposed to open? This is Google Chrome, the beach ball. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, playing your strengths, right? So some people will say, oh, because you're this, you have better opportunity to social engineer. I don't think that way. Um, it's a different opportunity, right? Capitalize on your strengths, understand who you are, understand what you can use to your advantage. Game is game. If you get in, that's it. Who cares who, who you are? I appreciate that. <laughs> So a little more unpacking for pretext. Preparing for multiple pretexts is kind of important. Uh, maybe even having the capability of swapping your pretext on site, your quick change, your mission impossible type shit. Uh, there are treasure troves of information online for employees and the drip they wear, right? Don't impersonate in ways that will make you catch a felony, please. Even though there's paperwork, it's not always with the right people. Uh, clothing for archetype covers, you can have your generic, you know, your hard hats, or your compliance gear. Run the shit into the ground, all right? If you're a construction worker and you show up with a new, bright, shiny vest, who the fuck are you? <laughs> you know, like, it doesn't help. So just understand, have that in your hotel room, have that in your deployment area, so you can uh, be ready to go. What I like to do is I like to outline props and skits um, and think of it like an acting class, right? So you can use your props to perform your skit with punchlines as your anchors. Your anchors can be your objectives. So say in this scenario, we have a clipboard with an RFID reader inside, which is this thing over here. These have a good amount of space. You can put a nice uh, low frequency reader in there. They can read like 10 centimeters if you amp it up. Um, and you say, okay, I have a, a coffee in my hand and a handkerchief, right? That's your prop. Okay, so I want to get a clone of this purchase and badge. That's a skit. I, I mixed these up. I'll have to go edit that later. And one of the things you can say is like, oh, Dan, could you hold this for me a real quick? I just got this coffee all over my shoes. Like, here you go, here you go, start. And they're holding it against their chest, and maybe it's a low frequency, maybe it's a high frequency, and it's just cracking there the whole time. Maybe you get a notification on your phone. Wire it however you want, but have those objectives laid out, and then think creatively of how you can achieve those objectives following those anchors. That way it doesn't feel like Mission Impossible. It feels like, oh, these little flags, and I just have to go talk to silly little people and get them to do this funny little thing. Uh, don't worry about your hotel room search. Uh, normally this doesn't happen, and certain scenarios it might. If it does, you probably know it's coming, so prepare. Uh, yeah, <laughs> anyways. I appreciate the advice. <laughs> uh, practically, uh, practicality packing. Have just enough tooling, right? You don't want to roll on site and pull tack gear if it's some type of covert operation. If you have a point of contact and you're there to demonstrate physical vulnerabilities and it's all authorized and they're there as well, then you can bring a tack bag and your whole kit and whatever, and like that's fine. But for covert entry, you don't really want that. Uh, different goals will have different loadouts. Raw material has a lot of use cases. You want to take your wine and your string and your pants. We'll get into details on the parameters for those here in a second. Plan for failure. If you're caught with X tool out, what do you do at that point? If you're caught by somebody of authority, what do you do at that point? Uh, planting your implants and uh, leaving a device. Some pretext I've used are, oh, I'm an IT person doing asset tracking. And I'm, you know, sorry, I just had to find this. It didn't show up on our network, so we got to inventory it. Thank you. Uh, ensuring Z devices are ready for an upcoming intercom meeting. Things of that nature work for that scenario. Uh, practice your quick deployment, right? You don't want to be like fumbling around with your tools and having things spilling out. And you're, you've got all your burglary tools outside, and then the cops are right there, and you're like, oh, I'm an IT guy. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> also, uh, definitely study up on what is legal and allowed on your person in case of X event if you are somebody who, per se, concealed carries a weapon. Don't try to break into a building with a concealed carry weapon at 3 a.m., okay? Like, just leave it at home. I have to understand that even if I do my job 100% correctly, if at 3 a.m. I am caught and I am shot, I'm, I'm just going to say, yeah, that's, that's fair. That's, you know, like, I scared you. I understand. I <laughs> so let's go over my kit. Uh, here's my uh, approximate kit. This is an older revision. The other, the door tool I've actually swapped out recently for some upgraded ones. Uh, so I have the Dylan's card, which is Drip. 
Um, I have this Mica, Super Mica Shim. It's not the actual like NAND brand stuff, and we'll get to that here in a second. You can use a plastic jug. Uh, I have the seamstress tape here. I have a UV flashlight. I have a yellow highlighter. I have some of the detective polarity of magnets. I forgot the name of that. Anyone know it? Okay, we'll go with the I have uh, your traveler pick. Uh, I have the shim tool. So this is the one I had in my sleeve when I was breaking into electric grid. Uh, we have some double door tool, double door tools here. And then another door tool, Kevlar string. We have our little file here. Um, and most of this will actually get through TSA, no problem. Not the UDT, they won't because it's a long one, but uh, the rest of the kit so far has been has been pretty fine. Uh, lock picks here, a small crowbar, a small magnet, some bump keys with the bands. Uh, gear ties are amazing, so shout out Rob Moore for that. Uh, bobby pins, uh, usually you keep those in your hair, etc. if you can. Uh, so yeah, here's my kit continued. So these are some sources for the uh, the kits that I replicated. So we have the mini J tool, and I'll have uh, uh, the specifications for this uh, later on in the video from uh, the humble firefighter. So shout out to her; it's great. Uh, Debbie Allum has some mods for the UDT. So the one I've applied here is the uh, heat shrink wrap over to this part for added friction. And then I've got the not so civil engineer tools uh, upgrades here. So I've got the Kevlar key back for that uh, deployment, and I put the notch on top so it can uh, also work for crash bars, which is kind of important. This horse team, I don't know what to call it, whenever like, the horses do that ankle wrap or something, I buy that in bulk. Uh, that one is for round doorknobs, so you can just tie that to the top of here and have added friction. Gaffer tape, some people swear by this. I think electrical tape's better in my opinion, but whatever to each their own. And spare super mic shim sheets. So this is the more electronic side of my kit. Uh, some of this won't pass through TSA. I've lost two of these so far. They're $120. What's that? What's that? <laughs> Leatherman. <laughs> the Leatherman, like the one with the shitload of tools. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, dude. Uh, but you can buy them actually at your local uh, your local government areas where they, they do sell. Uh, at least when I was in Austin, I would buy the ones that uh, the TSA in Texas would reclaim. And you can just buy Leathermans for like four bucks. Like, it's, it's crazy. So anyways, uh, what I have shown here are flashlight cables for all the gadgets, Ethernet, Ninja Star, your tape, your spare wire, your three millimeter wire, etc. Uh, and the rest of this talk will cover physical entry, implants, the best for wiretaps, and wireless evaluations. So as you can see here, a lot of these things you might know already, some of you may not know it. Uh, this is a Proxmark 3. I do uh, have the, the paid one, the one I spent money for, because it's cool for research. Um, wireless card that supports packet injection and all that good stuff. These tiny Arduino Malguinos, and we'll get into the details of all this later, but this is our gadgets and gizmos section. So talking about under the door tool options, normally your stock under the door tool from Safe Sparrows is going to be 42 inches in length to meet that 88 compliance, but there are some mods I do to it. So first I unfurl this area. This is spring steel. It's very important that if you're buying an under the door tool, it should be spring steel. Otherwise, just make your own out of other materials. So you have your standard ones, which are going to be spring steel, high carbon at one quarter, three eighths inch. That's very good. It costs you about forty dollars. It's foldable. It lasts longer. You have to do some mods, but it's it's great. It works. You know, out of the box. Uh, Zinc rods at Menards. Only trust these once. They're not great for folding. They're not great for concealment, but they'll work. I tried to conceal them once, and I was just walking around like this, and you know, it wasn't a good time. Uh, <laughs> So, other metals, try it and share it. I mean, like, who knows what else works better, or et cetera. I haven't tried this with titanium. That might be something to try next. Your budget or low profile ones, these come from directly from Not So Civil Engineer. He has some great examples. Uh, I definitely suggest you check out his video series because it is very comprehensive on all the modifications for different doorknobs and different scenarios. Uh, but your budget one is going to be out of copper tubing, quarter inch frame wire tape. You get three for about thirty dollars, and these you can't really easily substitute the Kevlar cord for the steel cable, uh, but that essentially makes this kind of uh, nice low-profile, cheap under the door tool that I will unfurl awkwardly here. Yay! Whoa! 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 Looks <laughs> suspicious. This turns the handle. Yeah. So essentially, if you have like a hook handle, a lever type handle, you can set this slide it under the door, and then you're able to pull this side. Uh, oh. You're able to try to pull this side, and close this so the handle gets pulled from the other side of the door. It's kind of mind-blowing, uh, TBH, that we have our whole like, society based on this. But yeah, it's kind of like a dog catcher, you know, a dog catcher catching dogs right there. Um, 
So yeah, that's something to do. Here's my uh, here's my kind of not everyday carry, but my standard over compromise one that has a gear tie on it. So this one, this is spring steel, so it holds its shape very well. If I were to come up here and unfurl this, unfurl that's it. Unfurl it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look how well they're tanned shapes, right? Ah, there you go. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a great one. Uh, and then being able to, you know, uh, fold that back down and, and go about your days is great. So just keep these things in mind. You're not always going to have one tool for every job. And yeah, let's continue. Also, these are, uh, I built the copper one like the night before last night. Went to Menards and like, dude, like this is crazy. Copper going up in price. I used to scrap that a bunch and sell it. But So here's kind of the mods I made a close up of it. I made that notch that uh, Not So Civil Engineer has made. So essentially you want to have kind of a bevel down here so you can catch behind the crash bar and then have the string apply uh, tension and force onto the crash bar. You only need about like, what is it, like five to 15 pounds of force around there, unless it's a really shitty flat crash bar and you're breaking into an abandoned place. Um, here's that one. Let's talk about shims, 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 shims. They're great, they're good. Um, super mighty shims, they're suspicious, so they can be bought in bulk. I recommend the uh, about 10 to 15 mil range for these Mylar stencil sheets. I actually have a goodie bag up here for people. I don't know how to distribute these. I definitely did not pack it up for all of you, so apologies. But these goodie bags do have some scrap in here, so you can make your own loading tools with these. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about these. Uh, you should only attempt to supplement, uh, use these to supplement the length of shorter cards. So a Dylan's card, for instance. Um, it's not always going to be able to reach certain scenarios. You may want the Super Mike Shim folded up in your wallet for a good measure. Your Dylan's card is free. It saves you money in the long term. And the fuck people going to accuse you of saving money? You have a Dylan's card. Like, wait, who cares? The thickness of material is very flexible, yet solid enough to go loitering. What's with. Dylan? We don't have Dylan's here. We don't have Dylan's here? No. Okay, any, any fucking store I card, did. membership card. Uh, yeah. Somebody try it with a Costco card and let me know how it goes. Burr. All right. Cool. Anyways, uh, you can use laminated paper, and uh, this takes works. It's flimsy at times, and it's dependent uh, on the area of the paper, uh, and having construction paper helps supplement that thickness. And this probably means you lost your shopper's card, didn't you? So here's an example that I have. Um, this shim, this plate, this anti-shim plate, do you think it protects this door if the latch is improperly configured? Take off the shim plate. Yeah, you could. Okay, so so don't, without destructing things on the building, do you think it will work? No. No. No, it doesn't. Okay, yeah, perfect. So essentially, you can cut these shims to have different shapes. The recommended shape is essentially this is facing the way you want to go into the door. So you have this to catch the bevel of that little little lock thing, uh, that latch. Uh, you can have this for these hotel or bathroom style locks. Um, there are other you know, types of cuts you can make for different scenarios, but yeah, that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, I recommend 10 to 16 mil thickness for best results. I have uh, this video. Then. Oh, okay. okay. So here's an example of me just going and shimming. So you can see here I'm using the Starbucks card. These are pretty good as well. Um, this one has no notches in it, so I'm just going in there and flexing it to push the plunger out. And then once I've done that, you can see that it's out, and I'm able to open it there. Woo! <laughs> Let's talk about strings and cordage. Steel cable, tear shit the fuck up, dude. If it's coated or shielded, you have to inspect it every use, otherwise you will tear up a client door, and it will be a pain in the ass to explain, all right? You will cause that damage to their property, and it's not gonna look good if you're a consultant. Um, rigidity is increased, and this increases uh, the space it takes up, so as far as folding it up, it has to go in a type of coil. You can't really fold it, or put it into shoelaces, etc. I mean, you could, it just wouldn't feel right there. Um, and it's difficult to cut without your beefier tools or your pliers. I recommend Kevlar rope, it's more forgiving, though it's easier to cut. Your small size has good strength, so 1.1 millimeter diameter, rated for 200 pounds of force limit. But the downside is it's heat resistance uh, to prevent fraying. You have to use resin, so you can't just burn the end of nylon rope like you normally would. You have to use some type of epoxy or resin on that to make sure it doesn't fray on its own. The seam stress tape is great. Some people use 35 millimeter film canisters. That's fine. 
But this can be used in point, place of film canisters over doors to get handles from the upside, so kind of the opposite way of the under the door tool functioning. Um, this has low friction despite its surface area. It's difficult to tie to objects. That's the thing. You have to know how to tie knots if you use it for an under the door tool um, shrink. So talking about more portage, we already talked about 35 millimeter roll. There is a lock picking lawyer de demo where uh, we collab with Devin Allen to uh, go ahead and get that uh, film to open up the door from the inside out. So this is kind of a casual object to have on yourself. That's cool. Gear ties, uh, they're not a substitution more for breaching. They're more so for collecting your, your uh, tools and having them all tidy. Uh, you could probably buy a long one, but I, why not just use wire at that point if you're going to use it for the breaching portage? So think about wire for electrical, your Arduino style DuPont connectors are good. I use these for serial connections with my flipper to program my implants before I go on site. That way you don't have to boot up a hotspot or have an extra router so you can uh, adjust that to each fix. Um, have some pairs of alligator crimps just in case, physical tooling. Two millimeter thick wire, I won't care if holding it to weight. Disassembling spark wire, real estate science, your fence wire, these will work great. Let's talk about picks. Lock picks are not always accessible. Some states have them, some countries will not allow them at all. Uh, these come in many shapes and sizes. Your spring steel and high quality ones are good. Um, generally, I've purchased some from Ally Express that are like $7 kits that I've had for like the past three years and they haven't broken on me yet. So, I don't know, it depends on the lock. I'm not good at lock picking, so definitely just understand that uh, it's a range skill. You can also have bobber bits or windshield wipers. There's sometimes not heat treating required. I recommend heat treating the windshield wipers if you're using them as the tension wrenches. Uh, but yeah, generally you just need pliers to make sure they're in, in good shape. So what I mean by that is your bobby pin, you'll sometimes have the ends have these little bolts, which don't really help, so you just cut those off. When you cut those off, try to file them down on the pavement or some type of light sandpaper so you don't cut yourself. That's so skilled. <laughs> I, I try, but no, it, it's not a lot. <laughs> uh, so, when you're cutting these windshield wipers, your tension wrenches, etc., um, you know, go to O'Reilly's after a rainy day. I, I assume you all have an O'Reilly's here, right? Yeah! Okay, okay, yeah, let's give it up for O'Reilly's. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you want to prepare your pasta here, um, and then you want to get it ready, and you want to have actually heat treat it. You want to hit it with a blowtorch, and then you want to punch it in either water or use motor oil. Um, I'm not allergic to shit, but who cares? It works, right? Uh, then you can take a Dremel and just kind of file these down. You can do this with a rat tail file, but Dremel is, is faster. So just keep that in mind. Um, this is about one millimeter. I think that's too thin. Two millimeters seems to be kind of the sweet spot for that, that little bridging area before you get to the thick part. Also, there are very thickness on these, so you may have to sand down the sides. Um, there's also these bra wires that you can use. Um, I, I don't use these, but you know, if that's a pretext you can use, you want to use, try it out, try it out, I guess. Yeah. I hope I remember this. <laughs> uh, the slides are available. I'll, I'll show that QR code at the end so you can get the PDF slides. Let's fucking go, Angel! <laughs> uh, talking about keys. A key duplicator is fucking nice because you can just go to eBay and like buy one of keys and then be the source of all your friends getting their default or common keys. These common keys, like your CH75 ones, do come on key rings and lock pickers, locksmiths will sell these online and say, oh, here's your common default key rings for office cabinets, etc. Um, and you can buy one of those and just duplicate the hell out of them. So this requires a working key, unless you have like a five axis CNC machine or an actual key cutting machine. Uh, they are very easy to use though, and you can uh, have those pre-manufactured key changes shipped to you. Oak, Oak City Locksport does have a, a keychain of doom video. Check the cable. Check the cable, okay. We're good now. Uh, or, okay, hey. cool. We're back. Uh, talking about keys continued, so common keys are going to have bump keys. Bump keys are these set of keys with uh, pins all at one certain position for the sole purpose of you slapping the shit out of it with some type of hammer. Um, the buffer ring is nice to have repeated attempts. It's kind of like a physical form of buzzing. You can do wall research on the little stuff. I use the goat banding times to cast straight goats, uh, but for bump keys. So you can just buy those packs and you don't have to buy any like hacker bump key rings or anything like that. So instead of goat rope, it's goat rings? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> instead of goat seed, it's goat rings. <laughs> So your hammer can be a, a variety of things. Stiffness is usually better energy transfer, but at the added cost of more sound. So just keep this in mind. It's my video, love you. 
And uh, yeah, so here's, here's a little video demo. Just a minute. So here we have a lock. Here we have a key. It opens right. That's how it works. What if you don't have the key? Uh, you know, right? Well, we have this pop key with a little goat banding thing, and it's the goat banding thing is unused, by the way. I don't, I don't live on a farm anymore. So yeah, this one's pretty torn up. I have a bunch of replacements here if you want to check that out. So there is narration in the video, but I'm silencing it because I hate the sound of my own voice. But whatever. So as you can see here, we're going to go through, and this bump, this uh, little ring allows the key to actually back. Every time you hit it in, it's going to actually back a little bit to try to get those pins into position. So I'm going to hit it with the butt of a screwdriver, and the sound here, you hear like a think, right? Like kind of a louder thing. It takes a few hits, and then very light tension on it, and it opens with that bump key. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things you can do, but, uh, Let's see, is this the second video now? Let's go for the other video. Let's see, okay, the, the second video demo, so. Okay, so in this video demo, uh, I think it was midnight, and I had 3D printed a, a phallic device that was hot off the press. And uh, this was the free model, all right? I didn't want to pay like $2 for an STL, okay? so. You want to go as goofy as possible with it. So this one is printed out of ASA plastic, it's very rigid. So a couple of bumps here, and boom, it's over. They've done that. It's very rigid, I think that's job. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the job, right? But it's a lot better, in my opinion, than this one that I tried with. So, I was a flare! I was a flare! You put that in your pool bag? I would, yeah, it's right here, if you want to see it. <laughs> somebody from high school when I went in to purchase that, so, uh, but whatever. So if anybody would like to try that and show me, bumping open uh, a lock, I don't have the lock with me, but bumping open, I have bump keys, uh, the lock with the silicone one, then I would love to see that, let me know, uh, that, that would be awesome, but on my part, it's a skill issue. <laughs> the silicone one? Yeah, so I really tried on the silicone uh, one. It was not the move for me at the time. I think with more skill, more practice, I would become decent at it and it would work. Which it was skill to use? <laughs> no, so normally, I would have experimented with like your polyurethane ones right now, but like anything rigid. You could even use your phone if you want to. But the thing is, what's the benefit about using a phallic device in this scenario? Because if I'm out here at 3 a.m. and I'm bumping a lock on a door and I'm over here, say, and then an officer shines his light on me, and I'm going, oh, ding, 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 and I say, oh, hey, officer, I'm eating buckshot. Okay, like that's, that's, that's what's happening, okay? If I am pounding on a door with this, and I start breaking down and crying and going, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, my boyfriend and I just broke up and we've been together for seven years. He works here and I'm so sorry. It's disarming the situation in a way that... <laughs> it's disarming the situation in a way that won't get you killed or get you just instantly dismissed sometimes. So you have the art of escalating things and de-escalating things, but there's the art of perversion, which sends this in a sidetrack manner that people are not prepared to deal with. You can deal with people's psyche in that manner and something they don't have experience with all the time, every day, right? Because if you're a threat, if you have a bump hammer or something of that nature to break in, they know how to deal with you. There should, hopefully at least, be a protocol to deal with this type of attacker and invader. So they will execute that protocol. You can also use vibrators or pumpkin carvers. These are noisier, they have power requirements, they have a time requirement to try to uh, go ahead and pick that lock open. Have you seen pumpkin carver? Yeah, your, your pumpkin carvers, your oscillating pumpkin carvers. Yeah, yeah. You just go there and you just tape the pick to it and you just have tension on it and it'll just go and... And it'll bump a thousand times. Yeah, it'll bump a bunch. Uh, I'm sorry I'm talking so much. No, no, you're good, you're good. What about a propane can with a compressed ice? It's my propane can for pressure. Oh yeah, I mean you could. I mean, at that point, if you have a propane can, just you know, like wire it to the door and like stand 300 feet back. But, uh, so let's talk about crash car bugs. Sorry, here, kind of dumb door tooling. 
Sparrows one is kind of bulky. If you do buy the Sparrows one, I actually have it here with me tonight. I can show you all later, etc. But uh, cut the rubber on the on the front of it. There's going to be a rubber tip. You want to get that off, and adds just extra. Need I say? Great. To it, and um, it makes it hard to squeeze into tighter doors. So, um, if you want to make your own, I recommend titanium bars if you can get them from online. Amazon has a bunch, you can buy them through 20 inch bars. Uh, your realtor signs have wire frames, they're going to be like steel. I don't think they're, they're not spring steel, they're like this like, weird candy, easy to bend steel uh, that can be used. Your certain hangers uh, will have enough metal to do this. This was my feeble attempt at making a double door tool. So, here's how we started. And here's what we end up with. So we have Kevlar string reinforcing this, this uh, gap right here. I have some gaffer tape on this side, and this is all folded inward to try to get that. For reference, this double door tool will support 20 pounds until it starts bending. Uh, this one will support like five. So just, just be aware of what you're working with. Talking about your double door tool, J tool, and specifications. This is from the Humble Firefighter. She has a bunch of great videos. She also has a video going over her larger tool. Um, this one specifically, you can see the specifications here. One inch, five inch, six inch, eight inch. Cool. Uh, three millimeter titanium rods are great. You can heat red, bend it, and then air cool it or sand quench it. Uh, it's very important that you sand quench or that you air dry. Uh, air dry? Man. Air cool them. Um, just so they don't become very brittle. brittle. Three millimeter steel is great too. You heat red, bend it, punch it in water, and use motor oil, and then you're good to go. Now, this example right here is something that is susceptible to a double door tool, double door tool attack. You can hit this little pseudo crash bar, is what I call it, and you can just actuate it from the outside in. But more importantly, what's not pictured in the contest of this of this picture is you can walk five feet around. What the fuck, bro? Thank you. Thank you. You can walk five feet around. And there's an open door to the area this is protecting, even though this is locked. So just, you know, check the easy shit first, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, okay, uh, I'm just going to play it. The audio is not going through to the people in the back. They have no idea about this joke. So this is the titanium rod. As you can see here, I've got a blowtorch. So much heat. Real. I'm just going until it's red. We're bending it slowly. With titanium, keep in mind there is a spring back factor for that alloy. So when you bend it, it's going to spring back a little bit. So you want to bend it a bit steeper than what you want it at. So if you want it 90 degrees, you know, do do a little more. You pee. You pee. Oh gosh. Oh. This is the point. Are you breaking the door? I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're good. Uh, th this is, yeah, so this is this is the breaking into the door. Essentially, you stick this through. You'll stick this through uh, this, this little wedge or this little gap area, and you'll actuate that inside crash bar from the outside. Oh, because the crash bar goes over the gap. Yeah, well, uh, the crash bar doesn't go, it, it is the latch, right? So the crash bar dictates, oh, if this is opening from the inside because of fire compliance, you have to be able to, like, slap that shit open and run outside, right? So, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it works. What did you I, I didn't come up with it. <laughs> I, I can just read, dude. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, just like asking asking a bunch of questions. That's how you, how you find out, right? So talking about forensic tools, finding keypad touches. This is something that I've seen online a lot. You can dust and react that with an ultraviolet light. You can also pay thirteen thirty seven for this dust. It doesn't even get you high. Wow, you pay thirteen dollars. Like cool, whatever. Uh, you can use sucrose based powder. So traditionally, I've used baking powder, but it's very hard to spot in certain scenarios because the granules are actually pretty big compared to other alternatives. Uh, they stick to oils easily. You can use honey dust, which I actually had a buddy bring this out to me today, who is helping me with the presentation, etc. So this is uh, Kama Sutra. They're, they're not paying me for this, but Kama Sutra brand honey dust. If you want to come up here, like feel it after uh, and see how fine of a powder that is, then you can. But essentially, that will pick up oil that's on surfaces very easily. Uh, Cornstarch, baking powder, powdered sugar. While you're baking, that's not really suspicious, right? Like, who cares? What percentage of your kit is from a sex shop? That's what uh, I would say at this point, 30% in climbing. Woo! Woo! Is this your alternative career? <laughs> it's my main career. I mean, <laughs> that was a sex shop. 
Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess. Or no, because there's a lot of licensing involved in Kansas and Texas. In Texas, there's a shit law that if you own six or more dildos, that's it, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you buy eight? Somebody needs Somebody needs to make a sticker that says come and take it and it's just like a bad dragon printed dildo or something. <laughs> but as you can see here, so you want to have a very light applicator, you want to have like a blush applicator or a feather duster. I'm using a sponge because it's what I had around. I don't wear a lot of makeup, it's not anymore. And uh, there's baking powder here that I've got and this is our pseudo surface that we've touched, right? So we're going to say, okay, I want to go in and test prints on this to find out what was, what was touched. So this first, uh, this first touch is going to be very heavy, so it's kind of like cheating, right? And this is brass, this is very clean brass, so these are like optimal conditions. It, it does get harder from here. And you can already see the fingerprint, right? This is on record, by the way, now the whole internet has like my, my fingerprint, or that finger, like RIP. Uh, so you can see there, we've got that set up, and I'm going to go ahead and just throw this dust on it. You can, you know, do the blow approach where you just, whatever, uh, I'm going to convince you to do something, or whatever. Um, and you can see that the dust kind of aggregates around the areas after I after I dump it a little bit. I'm just gonna dump it here. This is baking powder. So you can see here where these line up, and you can see the fingerprints a little more clearly on where they're collecting. So we have one here. And if I stop fucking moving it, thanks. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, but you can see where I'm pointing them out. I put the, put a little more dust on the areas that need more application. And you can see those fingerprint outlines a bit more clear. Now, granted, you do want to get honey dust. These are normally available at sex shops. They are not available at the Patricia's in Wichita, unfortunately. <laughs> so this attempt uses uh, neon highlighters. Oh gosh, my voice box. Um, <laughs> yeah, right? So I have the ultra light there. Um, you want to use a yellow highlighter, and this is basically me prepping the surface, right? You're kind of rigging a trap. It's different from the last one, and you can see how it looks under ultraviolet light. And now, essentially, if I press these, they're going to clearly appear and leave evidence, and you can see those outlines of where I press. So keep this in mind with keypads. You may have the time. Um, and energy to rig things up for a more successful attempt. Ow! Thank you. Uh, okay. Door alarms are, are cool. Um, I recommend KJ Magnetics. This is recommended to me by a colleague. Uh, they're very cool. Door alarms function off of some read switches that you can bypass if you have the right tools. So I will give a little disclaimer on this slide. This, um, this door alarm is very cheap. And it actually doesn't care what polarity you match up, and it will just take a <laughs> magnet on there. So you essentially have the sensor, you're checking out the polarities, and you want to replicate that polarity um, towards the alarm side, right? Normally, uh, this is placed on your doors, this is placed on your door frames. You may see variations depending on battery power versus wiring, etc. So I'll turn the sound on for this one. Uh, please be very quiet because it's not very loud up here. This is electrical sensor, though. Oh, yeah. To just So the concept, in theory, is to get a magnet between there. And there you go. You have it set up the alarm. Guaranteed, etc. And then you're good. You don't have to worry about setting that on the line. And then if we go ahead and remove it, then you could turn this the right way. Get it far enough, and it starts going off. So that's another thing too, is you'll encounter doors that have very slow gaps between these. You can use an air wedge to go between those gaps and expand that gap for a small pry bar. Please don't carry actual like pry bars on the gig. I have a small keychain one, if that works, cool. If not, use an air wedge. Don't use a fucking pry bar or consultant, not a firefighter. Skip. Um, Skip, yeah, skip. Oh gosh. So talking about HID, this is not my area of expertise. I mean, like, 
none of this is an area of expertise, so I just like am decent at some of it. Um, so RFID locks, um, they come in a couple different shapes, or a bunch of different shapes and sizes, but mainly you'll be looking at two different protocols, or two different uh, frequencies. Your 13.56 megahertz shields, which these are your high frequency, uh, your 125 kilohertz shields, which are uh, low frequency, and replicating you know, your Flipper Zero, your Proxmark, and all that. You can use Arduino components, and as long as the support is there for the hardware to be able to negotiate with the protocol on the card, then you're good, um, and you can do your dictionary-based tax, etc. Uh, there's an Android app, MKeys, that allows you to do dictionary-based tax on the Micro uh, 1K keys, so like hotel cards, uh, or a lot of common hotel cards. So this is a subject I'm not very good at, but cards are weird. You can also buy little rigs on eBay for pretty cheap that are readers, and have those uh, go through, and wire those up to your whatever rig you have, a Raspberry Pi, etc. These readers are nice to have. You can amp them up to have longer range. The antenna is already made. Uh, there are some videos on Great Scott's channel over making coils that perform better from these eBay ones. Check out disguises. Goodwill's drip. Uh, some of your swag can be ordered, so Walmart vests, etc. Lanyards, card holders have all those. If you have a type of photo ID or lanyard and your pretext is aged, you want to have that smudge with a sharpie or something of that nature so it looks like you've been there a lot, uh, or been there for a while. If you wear high-vis this, run that shit to the ground, wear boots, etc. Um, I've been recommended Z Ink printers uh, instead of this because the rolls of ink or the rolls for this are about $70 and I picked this up on eBay for $70. So Z Ink is something that is, is something I'm looking into uh, acquiring for uh, better pretext development and they're smaller. Talk about your implants, your USB HID implants. You have your DigiSpark $1 bad USBs, which I have a bunch of these. Uh, they're great if you just want HID attacks. I don't feel bad about leaving these in the client's computer. It's cool, it's whatever. I didn't drop a fucking $80 Raspberry Pi. Uh, you also have the Malvino Elite. There are some uh, other devices that uh, Luca has made from uh, the Weed Injector series. And you know, weigh the weigh the scenario. If you need um, HID attacks, etc., and that's how you use it. Um, kind of going up in the skill tree, you have your Pi Aloha, which is kind of an older project at this point. But this essentially was at the time like a huge advancement over the rubber ducky. I mean, like cool rubber duckies, whatever. Uh, this turned your Raspberry Pi Zero W into like a fully working ducky with the ability to bridge air gap networks. So it has some cool capabilities, and of course the code's online, you can edit it, you can contribute, you can change it however you want. The Pi Zero 2 W is out, alternatives may work, but you want to check the hardware support first. Um, for instance, I will buy the, where are these, I'm skipping a slide, so these um, Orange Pi Zeros, etc. I will buy these and then wait for RB and support, I'm not running their Chinesium on client networks. Um, so essentially, you also have the Logitech dongles, which this is something I stumbled on uh, more recently and need to dev for. But essentially, taking these Logitech dongles for your normal mice and keyboard connections, you can just wire them into a USB cable and have a lower quality OMG cable type device. So these are uh, your Logitech dongles aren't really offset friendly due to the plain text injection of that library that can change with added support from the community. If you use a Raspberry Pi Zero W. Can join all of these into a USB port. Um, it might be different on the Pi Zero Two W now, but if you're using the Pi Zero W, the first one, then it's yeah, the same. Oh, it's the same. Okay, cool. The ports are the same. Okay, yeah, yeah. So can join those if you if you want just the thing you can plug in with one USB port and have it be powered and working, etc. Network monitoring, network taps. I have your normal Pi Zero Threes. Uh, your orange pies, um, you want to spoof your Mac to normally match vendors on the network, or OUIs you you've seen, so Macs, printers, VoIP phones, or VoIPs, whatever. Um, you can add your GPIO buttons uh, as you see fit, so you can have it, so you can plug it in, and you say, okay, I want to start capturing packets now. Uh, sometimes people use the passive monitoring network taps, like these. The only problem with these is they do downgrade their connection speed to 100 megabits per second, so, and that's because they're, they're not powered. So if you do want to have a type of uh, listening tap, you can just buy a managed switch that supports mirroring and make sure it's gigabit, and that should work. So talking about Xfil methods, so this is my, my spread, my money spread, right? This is at a certain point in time, this is like three hundred dollars worth of SBCs. But, uh, so 
Uh, with Expo methods, you know, DNS tunneling out is kind of an older one, but it still works on most networks. Um, your lazy threat actors may use NGROC, Cloudflare tunnels, or FRP. You can purchase or wire in and wire in an LTE app to achieve your cellular network connectivity so I can text my implant. Um, powerless taps are error prone, so of course that's that signal degradation that we talked about. Now also you, you have no idea if you're going to fry something, uh, if you get like one of those PoE plus type of things. I haven't tried that personally. I've tried with PoE, it works, and nothing was fried, but I can't tell you it's safe if you go higher in relative to your amperage. So normally you have your network tap here, right, which is your dual com, and oh my gosh, two hundred thirty dollars, right? That's a lot of beer. Uh, but yeah, or you can just spend twenty six bucks and have the same. Talking about wireless, uh, stop using pineapples. I say this because recently a pineapple failed me on an engagement, and it was like mission critical. So I was just really pissed. I was able to fix and recover, uh, but like just learn TCP dump and air crack sweep, and knowing like what the protocol does. Um, yeah, don't trust things that are only have UI and they're like, oh yeah, you can pop a terminal if you want. So Linux plus better cap plus your five gig credit card with injection snap on cables. Uh, Ponagachi does a lot of this already. Ponagachi, just remember to turn off the telemetry. By default, the telemetry doesn't give off a lot of information, but it's still, you know, it's weird to have you yourself announced. So yeah, try the Ponagachi out. It's a plug and play thing. You can damage the Raspberry Pi. Uh, by default, if I recall correctly, it does use all the network cards on the device. So if you have your 5 gigahertz card plugged in, etc., it just adds up to better cap and goes. Um, so do your research on what cards you need and take full PCAPs during your wireless activities. <laughs> Talking about wireless, you use a cheap antenna. Um, here's an outline for a Yagi. Uh, little specifications made from this book. There are online calculators as well if you want to change parameters and uh, frequencies. So this is a big resource dump. Um, there is the FinSec Physical Security Village from DEF CON. They have bypass games online, so you can kind of get a pseudo-visual representation of how to game a lot of these systems. You can load on there. I definitely recommend checking out these YouTube channels and playlists. Uh, good amount of stuff there. These, this slide should be on the QR code as well. So the takeaways from this are be resourceful. Uh, you want to become ungovernable, really. Um, if a client tells you, like, hey, only sophisticated threat actors can do that, or we don't have any logo around here besides you guys, go and shit their shit with a plastic bottle and watch their face. Um, once you've learned a concept, go back and do it with shit your tools for fun. Make it harder. Fucking grow, right? Uh, repeat it until you can do it with as minimal supplies as possible. You can do, uh, what I want to do is have like a speedrun type leaderboard where it's like the sex shop challenge where we have ranks for every geographic location and have different, uh, you know, like, oh, I was able to build these tools with supplies from these shops and have categories for that. But uh, stay out of trouble. Uh, and you can also join the DC 306 server. This is the local DEF CON chapter we run the Wichita. Uh, we're kind of active online. We're more active in person. We have monthly meetups last Friday every month. Uh, check that out. Also, check out OzSec. It's a security conference I help organize. I run CTFs. I'm kind of a game master for that. Uh, that happens once a year in Wichita. This year, we're looking at doing a two-day conference. So that's one day, uh, supposedly, with presentations, and then one day with workshops. And hopefully, if I get everything together, we'll have a physical security workshop where you can come and demo these things. Uh, and yeah, that's that's the whole presentation. And I've got I've got some goodie bags to hand out. I don't know how we should distribute these. Um, uh, can we give up? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure, that works. Uh, so here you go. So that has uh, that has your windshield wiper blade and uh, plastic shims. So uh, yeah, actually. We come up here, and if you know, if we run out, like it's trash. Like, are you mad that you didn't get trash? Like, come on, get, the dumpster probably has a shit. So, uh, like, <laughs> ready? Ask, ask the bartender for any empty two liters. Uh. But yeah, that's the talk. Thank you, everybody, for your hospitality and your time. I uh, really appreciate it. Y'all have a great crowd and a bunch to talk to. So yeah, thanks for letting me do my shit. Woo!